Okay, I think I think we're good, Sarah. Go ahead right. and start us off. For All right, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome, I'm Sarah Bridge, the former executive director of the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Um, I've stepped down the, as the executive director, um, and I'm so pleased to introduce Amanda Verhul, the interim director who's um, stepping up and um, taking the role as the interim director. I'm honored to open the third year of the Wild Sheep webinar series, featuring tonight Dr. Kevin Monteith with the University of Wyoming and, Dar and Dr. Marco Festa Bianchi in this program, Horn Size and Hunting. Is there a controversy? I am pleased to open this panel tonight as we bring together two researchers committed to conducting and disseminating unbiased, peer-reviewed scientific research for the benefit of wild sheep. As conservationists, we are committed to the best practices and management programs that allowed for the continued health and prolif proliferation of the species. In recent years, we have witnessed pernicious polarization, um, increase between anti-hunting and pro-hunting groups. Just as in politics, polarization can cripple progress and cause individuals to divide themselves into distinct and mutually exclusive camps. We have witnessed an us versus them mindset around this topic. We bring Marco and Kevin together tonight on a panel um, to bring light to evidence around this topic. Is hunting unilaterally harmful to, to horn size and the health of wild sheep? Is the issue black and white and the outcome such? Um, and if so, what are the parameters and what should we do as people who really care about wild sheep on the mountain? Thank you, Marco and Kevin for joining us tonight. With that, I introduce Amanda Verhul, our interim director of the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, you're on mute. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate you all joining us tonight. I'm Amanda Verhuel, the Interim Director at the National Bighorn Sheep Center. Our mission is to provide education and outreach for the national conservation of wild sheep, wildlife, and wild lands. Tonight, we are also going international. We are honored to have Kevin Monteith presenting today. Kevin is a professor and Wyoming Excellence Chair in the Haup School of Environment and Natural Resources in the Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, Department of Zoology and Physiology, at the University of you Wyoming. Your name of the thing, or just your name on my picture. And I would like to remind you all that if you uh, come in to please mute as you come in this evening. Kevin leads a team of researchers, the Monteith Shop at UW where their program is focused on addressing big picture is issues associated with the management and conservation of large ungulates, often through individual based research and intensive field studies to gain a mechanistic, mechanics, excuse me, understanding of the influences large mammals and how they cope with the changing world. Through their work crosses multiple species of large mammals. A centerpiece of their effort focuses on bighorn sheep. Some of their long-term individual-based work has contributed to the understanding of various aspects of life history, resource allocation, growth and reproduction, growth of secondary sexual characteristics and behavior. Presenting first this evening is Dr. Marco Festa Bianchet. Marco is the head of the biology department at the University of Sherbrooke. Dr. Festa Bianchet is a preeminent scholar of wildlife ecology, the former chair of the committee. You know you're on, on the, the camera, right? Yeah. When you walk over here, you're on the camera, just like I am. Yes, okay, I am. fine. You want 
who's not speaking, please mute themselves. Oh, I'm just telling you. Tim, could That's you please volume, mute yourself? Yeah. Right there, it's 100%. <laughs> What's Marco it? Marco is the head of the biology That's department at the University of Sherbrooke. Dr. Festa Bianchet is a preeminent scholar in wildlife ecology. The former chair of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, Marco's research has taken him around the world, studying bighorn sheep, mountain goats, and caribou in Canada, kangaroos in Australia, and ibex and chamois in the Alps. The author or co-author of more than 250 scientific papers. For 16 years, he was the chair of the Mountain Ungulate Specialist Group of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. In 2022, he was awarded the Ian McTaggart Cohen Lifetime Achievement Award by the Canadian Section of the Wildlife Society for his outstanding contributions to the understanding, conservation, and management of wildlife in Canada. A native of Piedmont, Italy, he holds a PhD in behavioral ecology from the University of Calgary and a postdoctorate from the University of Cambridge. Take it away, Marco. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I'd like to start by saying that I really appreciate this opportunity. As you've hinted, this is a somewhat controversial uh, issue. And I think it's extremely important that I talk to people that are involved with sheep hunting because I believe there's no conservation of North American mountain sheep uh, without sheep hunters. So when will hunting of bighorn sheep lead to an evolutionary change in uh, horn size, and is that a problem? So before, uh, okay, oops, okay, I guess I have to do share. Before I get into that, a little bit about me, I'm into long-term studies. Most of my work has been with mountain angulate. Uh, what you have here is a timeline of uh, five long-term studies that I've been involved with. Thick line is when I was involved, uh, the other line is when the study continued uh, without my direct involvement. So in addition to the Ram Mountain study, that is the one that uh, be front and center tonight, I started another big on sheep study at Sheep River, which is now being continued by a former graduate student, Catherine Rooks at the University of Calgary. And I started a long-term mountain goat study at Courage, also in Alberta, which is now being continued by Steve Cote and Sandra Amel. I also work with uh, Ibex in Italy, in the Gran Paradiso, and... Uh, Getting older, it's getting a bit harder to go up and down the mountain. I started working something on a little bit more of a flat area, kangaroos in Australia. I'll point, I'll begin also by acknowledging a very large number of people, student collaborators that have helped and contributed substantially to the study. And obviously the agencies that have uh, financed this long-term work, particularly uh, the Natural Science and Engineering uh, Research Council of Canada. But the main secret, the main ish, the main key to what I'm going to present in you today is that I've been very fortunate to have a number of excellent uh, graduate students. And in this picture, you got most of the ones that have been involved with uh, bighorn sheep and mountain goat uh, research. Also, um, when I talk to um, sort of a wildlife management hunting audience, I unfortunately, because of some of the, well, some of the poison that's been hit on my, that's been heaped on my research, I have to point out that I'm not the bad guy you've heard about. So for example, when uh, I was chair of the uh, UCN uh, Mountain Angular Special Group, I took a leading role in developing some guiding principles in trophy hunt, on trophy hunting, which were then slightly modified and adopted by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature to provide this guide, uh, these uh, guiding principles, which have become very useful. For example, they've been used by uh, the US Fish and Wildlife to look at what kind of hunting program from African uh, uh, rhinos, elephants, et cetera, can be uh, actually part of a conservation program and can actually be uh, authorized for things like trophy import. I was also a signatory of this uh, letter in science, which uh, elicited much gnashing of, gnashing of teeth from anti-hunting types, uh, pointing out that, yeah, the worst thing you can do if you want to protect wildlife is to ban the import of uh, trophies. Uh, 
something that was particularly relevant within a British context with the recent attempt of uh, banning imports from, uh, uh, well, mostly foreign uh, uh, toys. So I'm not as bad as you've heard of it. So here's the key problem. Uh, this ram from uh, Sheep River, Alberta, um, when he died, was actually the world record ram for a number of years until a bigger a ram with bigger horns was taken or found in, uh, I think, a wild horse island on uh, the Flathead, uh, Flathead Lake. Uh, and it shows really the crux of the problem. These large horns are what leads these males of high reproductive success. They're also what attracts trophy hunters. And the conflict arises if these animals are taken by trophy hunters before they have an opportunity to reproduce. The more observance among you may have noticed there's something wrong with the horns of this ram and somebody illegally took a shot at it, hit him in the horns and uh, he survived uh, the shot and he died. He was actually hit by, hit by a vehicle on the road two years after this picture was taken. And like I said, he was the world record uh, sheep, you know, a big horn sheep for a number of years. If the poacher would shot at it and managed to get it, this would have been a very good example of road hunting. And I think it exemplifies what I see maybe as the underlying problem under all that we're going to talk about tonight. This idea that, you know, the competition, mine is bigger than yours. I think sheep hunting should be promoted because sheep hunting is... Uh, important, not because I shot a bigger ram than what you shot. Uh, but again, the point is big horns, high mating success if they survive to an advanced age, uh, but also is what attract uh, the interest of hunters. So when will selective hunting lead to evolution? And of course, the other way of looking at this slide is when, how can we avoid uh, evolution effect of uh, trophy hunting. Well, first of all, horn size has to be inheritable. And we have clearly established that, like most mammalian physical characteristic, about 30 to 40% of the variability in horn size is inheritable. So if your father had large horns, if the father of your mother had large horns, if uh, you know your ancestors had large horn, you probably will have larger horns than the average in the population. I said 30 to 40% which means that more than half of the variability is something out of an evolution. And Kevin will talk about this later, and it's mostly population density and uh, resource availability. So we can establish horn size is terrible. Then you need intense harvest, intense selective harvest. And it has to be over a number of years. And why is that? Because you're going against natural selection. Natural selection favors rams with large horns, the hunt, takes his rams out uh, selectively, it will have an evolution effect only if it's very intense. And you will see later what I mean by intense. If you really want to be effective, you got to bring that selective pressure early in life. Another way of looking at this, you got to shoot those, horn, those rams with large uh, horns before they have a chance to breed. You also need to have it consistent over a very large area so that you don't have uh, immigration from, say, protected areas swamping the evolution effect. And if there is immigration from protected area, you should shoot them. I'm not going to have the time into this. This relates specifically to the situation where you have immigrants from uh, national parks. Now, unfortunately, if you look at this list of uh, re uh, ways in which you can get a Volubush effect, this pretty much describes uh, the way uh, bacon sheep are harvested in Alberta up to this day. To understand why this is uh, important, where horn size plays a role, it's important to understand the system of big horn sheep. So during the rut, you have two main uh, tactics the rams are going to use. If you're a big ram, usually seven, eight years of age or older, and you have large horns, you're right at the top of the dominance hierarchy, typically you're number one, two, or three, you can tend estrus use. Normally, one at a time, this guy is being a bit overambitious. He's trying to defend two at the same time. Uh, but what he will do, he will defend uh, Nistrus U, copulate with her multiple times. Other rams that are not in the top, maybe three or four spots in the dominance hierarchy, will adopt this alternative tactic, which we refer to as coursing, 
which essentially means they'll try to break the ram's defenses, the U runs away, and they'll try to copulate uh, with the U uh, sort of on, on, uh, on the run. So the ram that's tending the U will be the father of the lamb about 60% of the time, which means that this alternative technique or tactic is effective about 40% of the time. Uh, of course, 40% that is to be shared among a large number of rams that are uh, using this coursing tactic. So if you get to be at the top of the hierarchy and you can tend use, you'd be a very successful uh, ram. A lot of lambs would be your descendants. The key point here is that if you made it to a minimum of probably about seven years of age and you have large horns, you'll have a higher reproductive success. So if you're a dominant rams that can tend defend use, horn size is important. If you're a younger ram, you resort to this coursing tactic and horn size is not very important. Uh, it's more whether you're gonna be willing to accept risk of getting hit by the dominant rams, whether you're quick, fast, et cetera. So horn size plays a role if you make it uh, to be a seven year old or older and you can defend individual easterns use. So what are the consequences of this? What you have here in this uh, uh, surface, this fitness surface, is the relation between relative horn length here. Uh, let's see if I can find the... Find a better pointer. Yeah. So, here, very large horns for your age, small horns for your age. Here is age from two to 14, and here is your remaining success. So if you're seven years of age and older, if you have large horns, your mating success goes up and rams that do very well are older rams with large horns. If you're age two to about five or six years, horn size is not really all that important. You see, this is mostly flat, but notice that it's not at zero these younger rams will obtain some paternities. And we have two-year-old, three-year-old rams that will, you know, they'll get lucky and they'll get some paternities. And I should put out bighorn sheep are one of very few animals that we actually have this kind of good information on uh, mayor reproductive success based on, uh, on genetic data. So if you have large horns that make you legal, before you make gate to seven, you're likely to get shot. So what you have in this picture is a four-year-old ram, and you can tell it's an exceptionally well-developed four-year-old rams, which can legally shot uh, a sheep river in, uh, in Alberta because his horns were legal. So the definition of legal ram in Alberta is shown here by the plexiglass. You have to draw an imaginary line from the base of the horn to the tip of the eye. And if that intersects the horn tip of the horn, you can shoot the ram. Uh, my point here is that if this ram had been, say, an average four-year-old and it horn, his horns had stopped about here, it would have been illegal for the hunter to shoot it. Because it fit the four-fifth definition, he got shot. He probably never had any reproductive success. He was too young. Had he not been shot, he would have had very high uh, reproductive success if he matched to eight. So... The regulations, the hunting regulations for trophy sheep, and it's a bit unfortunate, the license actually called a trophy sheep in the, in the Canadian province of Alberta, is based on this legal definition, on this definition of what we call a legal ram. There's no quota. If you're a resident of Alberta, you can buy a license over the counter. So the only thing that limits the harvest is the availability of legal rams. With this kind of hunting regulations, the negative selection meaning the probability that you will get shot comes in at, if you're a very rapidly growing ram, a ram with large horns when you're young, it comes in at age four or five. The advantage, meaning you get to breed more use, comes in at seven or eight. So the negative selection from the hunt comes in one to three years earlier than the positive, than the positive selection from every large horn, which sets up a mechanism for an advantage to rams that have smaller horns because they don't get shot. And the selection is strong. 
And this is something that I really get to need to get across that often we hear, well, how can there be selection? We're shooting 2% of the population. It doesn't make any difference what proportion of the population you're, is being taken. What makes a difference is if you are a legally harvestable ram, what are the chances you will get shot during the hunting season? And in the study area of Ram Mountain, which is a not a very easy access, so probably harvest rate is lower than in some other places in the province of Alberta with easier harvest. Harvest rate of legal ram was about 40%. And I point out that this is a statistics that we rarely have. It's really rare that we know how many rams are potentially harvestable before the hunting season and how many get taken. With 40% harvest rate, if you're legal at age four, your chances of making to rat at age seven, once you include the hunting mortality and the natural mortality, is 8%. If you're not legal until you're eight, and then you have to only have to deal with natural mortality, your chances of surviving from age four to rat at age seven is 60%. This is a huge difference. This is really strong selective pressure. This is comparable to the selective pressure that we put on domestic animals. And what you have in the picture here is half of a skeleton of a merino sheep, the way they look like when they were first brought into Australia in the late 1800, and what merino sheep looks like. So directional selection through selective breeding for domestic, uh, you know, because farmers wanted bigger sheep has led to these huge differences. And the kind of intense harvest that we have under this hunting regime can lead to similar consequences. So what are those consequences? Well, in the Ram Mountain uh, population that we've been uh, working, monitoring for over 50 years, we have a very detailed pedigree, which means that when you use the same techniques that farmers or animal uh, domestic animal uh, scientists use to look at evol uh, evolution of, you know, better wool in sheep, more milk in cows, more aggressive dogs, whatever you want to select for in a domestic animal. So what you have here is for cohorts born from uh, the early 70s up to about 2012, the average horn size. And in blue, you have the actual average horn size that is measured for the whole court, adjusted to age. So the zero is about the average over the whole study. So you see this very sharp decline uh, for the blue point, about 18 centimeters over 28, 30 years. Most of that is due to an increase in population density. So why did the horns decline by you know, a substantial amount? Well, because density went up and there were fewer resources. You'd hear more about this uh, from Kevin later on. The key here is the orange line. The orange line represents the breeding value, sort of the genetic value for horn length for the same cohort. And that decline by about two and a half to three centimeters. So this is not an important point. It's not a huge decline. Most of the decline here was due to density, but we definitely pick up using this technique, which is the same that would be used by somebody who's interested in domestic animal, like I said, using, you know, milk uh, production in cows or uh, any other trade in domestic animals. And this is the main evidence that the very intense selective hunt led to an evolutionary change in horn size. The dotted line here is 1996, when the de legal definition of uh, what you can shoot changed from four-fifth to full curl. Given the ramps were small by then, mostly because of high density, there were almost no legal rams in the population. There were hardly any that were shot in the inter, in the following 30 years. And the decline stopped. It didn't fully recover, but when you took away the selective pressure, intensive hunt for legal rams, the, the, the genetic decline in horn size uh, stopped. Uh, this slightly increase not quite statistically significant, but the point is that it, it stopped. So clearly the hunt was leading to an evolutionary uh, decline in uh, horn size. And this evolution decline horn length is not the entire 18 centimeter. It was about two and a half centimeter over three uh, sheep generations. Okay, so this is to me very strong evidence that yes, in some specific circumstances, selective hunting can lead to evolutionary change. And the take home message is that 
horn size affects sighting success on mature rams. Younger rams get some matings, but it's mostly independent of how big the horns are. Very intense trophy hunting led to evolution of small horns, and that decline stopped when the hunt stopped. Great. Does this happen all year round? Ram Mountain is uh, the only population uh, with uh, long term pedigree, with this kind of data, with uh, uh, you know an, an experimental cessation of the hunt. Does it happen over a broader scale? Well, obviously we don't have this kind of genetic data from uh, a wider scale. So what you can use is harvest data. And most jurisdictions have been collecting data on harvest of bacon sheep for decades. So that information is very useful, but it's biased. You cannot just take it at face value. The size of the horns of the sheep that are shot by hunters is not a random sample of the population for two reasons. First, if you have a legal definition of what you can, you cannot shoot, small rams cannot be shot. If your horns are really small, you'll die of old age because it's illegal to shoot you. And if your horns grow quickly, you get shot when you're younger. So here is the data from British Columbia, uh, Rocky Mountain Big or Sheep in British Columbia, where they use a, the definition of legal ram is full curl. So it's more restrictive as in Alberta. And what we're looking at is the length of the horn growth from grown from one to five years. So as you know, with annuli, you know, even if the ram is eight year old, you can tell, well, how much uh, did it grow between the second and the fifth year? Obviously, we don't include the lamb annulus because it gets broken off. And you can see this substantial decline in growth over the first uh, five years of age. So the ones that get shot at five and six, as five and six year old, they have to be very large rams because otherwise they wouldn't fit the definition. So if your horns grow quickly, you get shot when you're younger. And then the ones that get shot at 10 years and older tend to have much smaller growth in those first five years of life. And that's what allowed them to live a long, longer age. They weren't legal until they were older. And obviously, this information doesn't include the really small rams, which never get shot because they're never legal, so they don't make it into the, uh, into the sample. So once you are aware that there is biases with uh, harvest uh, data, you can look at this long-term uh, data from harvested rams, and what do you find? Well, for example, in Alberta, you find the rams are getting smaller. Over uh, about 30 years of data, 30 years of uh, measuring rams, once you account for age differences, the horn size has declined by about three centimeters, which kind of fits uh, with what we found at Ram Mountain in terms of the genetic decline. And it's taking longer to rams to become legal. So on the left here, you have the average age of harvest of each cohort uh, from the mid seventies to about 2012. And you can see age at which rams are getting shot is going up in the late seventies, early eighties was the average was a little under seven years of age. And more recently it's gone up to about seven and a half years. And you must say, great, you know, that's what we want. We want to shoot all the rams. Well, unfortunately, the reason why the age has gone up is because the proportion of young rams has declined. And you can see here really where the problem was. Look at the 70s, uh, late 70s up to the early 90s in Alberta, the proportion of the harvest that was made up of rams age four or five. These are young rams that probably have had very limited or no reproductive success yet. They have large horns, they're legal, they get shot before they can participate in reproduction. In some years, a quarter to a third of the harvest in the province of Alberta was made up of four and five year old. As horn size, uh, horns grow diminished, most of these young males were not legal. So then in recent years, the proportion in the harvest has declined to most years less than 10%. But that is not because hunters are being more selective and they're avoiding younger rams, it's because these younger rams are just not legal. So evidence from Alberta that yes, rams are getting smaller, very intense uh, selective hunt, very long season, a little over two months, no quota. Problem is I don't have a control. Hunting regulation are the same everywhere in Alberta. So, you know, maybe this decline could be due to something else, uh, climate change or whatever. Um, it's illustrative to look at uh, data from British Columbia stone sheep. In Northern British Columbia, there's two, well, there's three, but uh, two large areas where stone sheep are hunted. 
And in the piece where access is better, hunting intensity is much higher than in the ski nut. So if you look uh, here about 30 years of data, we can see that in the area, this, the piece with high hunting intensity, early horn growth, so this is the second or third annuli in the horn, has declined again by maybe three centimeters, again, fits with what we found on a mountain. In the skina, where hunting uh, pressure is lower, there's no change, it's a flat line. So I think these data are extremely important because they show, yes, intense trophy hunting can lead to an evolution change, but it's easy to avoid. All you have to do is reduce the intensity of the hunt, make sure you allow some of these large horn rams to survive to eight, nine years of age so they can breed before they get shot. So the take home message here is that harvest regulation can prevent evolutionary effect. Uh, it's quite easy to do. The regulation we have in Alberta have caused a, an evolutionary shrinkage of big horn shaped horns. And the key point is if you want to avoid this evolutionary effect, you should not shoot young rams with big horns. Here is some work in progress. This is age distribution of ram harvested in four Canadian jurisdictions, uh, two provinces, two territories. And I draw your attention to the green bars. These are rams older, nine years of age and older. Doll sheep in the Norwest territories down here. Most of the harvest is rams that are nine, 10, 11 years of age. These rams have bred, they left the gene in the population. This is highly unlikely to have any consequences. Uh, look at Alberta here up on the top left. Uh, proportion of nine, the green proportion of nine years and older is very small. And in the earlier years, a lot of rams shot when they were four or five years. And that was caused to uh, cause the problem, the evolutionary change that I mentioned to you. So as much as I'm going to try to convince you that yes, you can induce evolutionary change in big horn sheep or in mountain sheep and lead to smaller horns, it's easy to avoid it. You just have to not uh, kill so many uh, young rams with large horns before they get to have an opportunity to breed. Um, I'm not sure I'll do it for time, but I just want to spend a few minutes pointing out that sheep have the perfect combination of biology and physical characteristic that makes them a prime candidate for this kind of evolutionary change. Selective hunt will not necessarily lead to evolution. Two examples, uh, chamois, and I got interested in mountain angulate growing up as a chamois hunter in the Italian Alps. Chamois show very strong uh, compensatory growth. So what you're, we're looking at here is the horn growth of um, chamois comparing how much they grew in the first two years of life to how much they grew in year three and four. And you see this very strong uh, negative uh, correlation. So if they grow a lot of horns early in life, they grow very little in the following two. Their early growth is slow, they pick up later. Probably because horn size doesn't play a huge role in the success of these, rant, of these uh, males. The point here is that if a hunter shoots a young male with large horns, he's not necessarily taking out of the population a male that had a very high reproductive potential later on, as is the case in big horn sheep. Another case, mountain goat. Mountain goat, uh, one of, another one of the very few species where we actually have very good data on male reproductive success, what makes a successful mountain goat belly? He has to be big, body size. They have to be 105 to 110 kilos or heavier. Then they get a lot of matings. Horn size plays almost no role. And the correlation between horn size and body mass of adult male is very, very weak. So to sum things up, if you want to have uh, evolution caused by selective hunting, stronger irritability of the horn, of the trait, horns, we know that. The trait is directly fitness related. Big horn sheep, yes. Mountain goats, no. Selective pressure is intense and selection is early life. In other words, you're killing young rams. With management, you can easily manipulate these last two uh, categories and you can easily avoid uh, this evolution effect. So that's my take home message and thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Marco. Uh, thanks, Amanda, Sarah, for bringing us all together tonight. Uh, I do want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that it's a humbling experience and an honor to follow Dr. Festa Bianchet, uh, along with this topic, which of course he's he spent a lot more time throughout his career uh, addressing some of these questions within uh, within bighorn sheep and and other species. I think it's certainly a topic uh, oh that's kind of been proliferated in social media uh, and been made to be perhaps somewhat of a controversy that it probably doesn't have to be, as I think Marco did a good job of describing. And so I think what I'm going to do is take a bit of a dip into the arena uh, that Marco spent some time talking about, uh, discuss some of the work that we've done uh, to sort of take a broad sweep of looking at some of those dynamics within sheep populations, and then consider another factor that I think amongst all the hype associated with genetics and big horns, and all the controversy that's kind of stirred up from that uh, it's kind of been overlooked over time. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge as a key driver uh, in big males. Before I get into uh, the specifics of what we're going to talk about, uh, certainly within our program as a whole, uh, we do a lot of collaborative work. Some of the collaborative work I'm about to speak to is that of which has occurred across the West with a lot of partners that have made uh, the work possible. Of course, today uh, we're talking about these guys with these amazing uh, structures on top of their heads that can exceed or or rise to 12% of their body mass. They inspire us. Uh, they captivate our imagination uh, and, of course, have fueled a lot of controversy at the same time. So part of what we're going to continue to discuss is um, where, how do these things arise? Where do they come about? I won't spend much time talking about the biology associated with it as Marco went through what they are as traits relative to uh, a, a, second, uh, a secondary sexual characteristics that plays a role in reproduction. Um, but more or less talk about this, of course, this role associated with hunting uh, and uh, you know, acknowledge the role that hunting plays within conservation as a whole, within our hunting heritage, and of course, the North American model. But what we end up wrestling with at times is when bits and pieces of work, and as Marco acknowledged, uh, you know, much some of this controversy has been fueled by some of the work that he's done over time uh, that he's brought to surface. And then these very bold blanketed statements are made of how hunting is driving evolution in reverse. <clears throat> and so as as is part of the the whole crux of the issue here that we're talking about this is a really important thing to be able to wrestle and contend with and understand how or if and when that is actually a thing and when it may select against these attributes uh, for these traits that we actually desire often desire at the same time if we get down to the basics associated with it there's three primary factors that influence the size of horns that a male possesses and those are age, genetics, and nutrition, which probably everybody that's listening here knows already. To break that down a bit further, when we consider horned animals uh, like bighorn sheep that are basically adding, adding a horn section of growth each year, basically they're going to attain their maximum size at their oldest age, notwithstanding grooming or breakage that may occur. And so, of course, age, the age of an animal is going to play a fundamental role uh, in the size of horns that he uh, has on his head. Uh, and what that means when we when we step aside and consider that from a harvest based perspective and how harvest may influence horn size, it may have a role by dictating the age structure that exists within a population. So, for example, if we implement a harvest uh, on a population, it's going to influence what remains uh, within that population that may be influenced that may be driven simply by way of the age structure. So if we consider that and consider it through the lens of this horn growth curve with respect to age, say we have mean age of harvest uh, at this age on that horn curve, and then over time through harvest, now this is just harvest period, it doesn't imply that it's selective, but it's harvest and it drives down the age structure within the male segment of the population and we see a reduction in age, what that's potentially going to do is take the average horn size of harvested males and it's gonna drive it down. 
This notion of influencing the size of males evident in the harvest by manipulating age structure via harvest is simply a demographic effect of harvest that's driving the yield associated with horn size and the age structure of males present within the population. So of course, age is a critical factor that has to be uh, acknowledged or accounted for in any analysis, any analyses that are addressing these changes that may occur over time, as Marco already talked about, and many of his metrics associated with age corrected horn size. The other side, and where uh, I guess much of the controversy lies, is in this notion of selective harvest. The idea that by way of harvest, we are selectively removing large, fast growing males at an earlier age and therefore selecting against the very trait that promotes rapid, fast-growing males, as Marco uh, indicated and demonstrated for us. Now, what that's going to do <clears throat> is it's not necessarily a, an effect that's going to be borne out by manipulating age structure in the population, but the whole notion of the way in which this would influence this process is it's going to basically, it's if it's happening, it would drive down the way in which males are growing horns because you're gonna be expected to have smaller horns for a given age if we're selecting against rapidly growing males and that, and that is causing genetic, um, that's having deleterious effects from a genetic standpoint with respect to horn growth. The other side of this that's often, often I think we often fail to acknowledge and Marco mentioned it within his talk is the notion that these traits are secondary sexual characteristics. They're not necessary for survival. That is a, a male's horns per se anyway, don't necessarily, he doesn't need to grow the horns to survive per se. Um, and yet at the same time, then we might consider them more of a luxury trait or a trait that if they can grow it, it's to their benefit. And therefore what that means, given that they don't come for free and are not necessary for survival, is that the resources that males have and potentially females, as I will show you, influences the size at which they're able to attain. Now that's, again, that's influencing this horn growth curve. So poor environmental conditions, poor nutrition is gonna suppress the way in which they grow horns versus more favorable environmental conditions. So when we break down these pieces, we need to acknowledge and be able to contend with at least the best of our ability as we work to break out these potential effects and what we can drive, what could be driving change in horn size of males through time. So as Marco indicated, uh, much of his work uh, to address some of these questions associated with the role of harvest and other attributes has been done uh, in Alberta. And then he also brought some other data sets to light um, from Canada as well. What we wanted to be able to do in addition to that, because as Marco indi indicated, much of the harvest regulations uh, specifically within Alberta are drastically different than those across much of the Western US. And so although harvest data are biased, they are one of the most robust and long-term data sets that exist for us to be able to look back in time and assess trends in horn size because of the efforts that have been put forth by state and provincial agencies to be able to collect data on horn size and age of harvested rams. So we collaborated with uh, our Western states and colleagues, uh, as well as uh, one Canadian province, as well as Alberta, uh, to be able to bring as much data as we could to light to be able to look at these patterns over time. To give you a sense of um, what this looked like as we process through this, just we'll just step through a couple of hunt units real quick. Um, so the top left is just mean size of harvested males through time within this hunt area. What you note is it was relatively stable over time, but then what you also note is that the, the mean age of harvested animals increased over time. So what we did with those information is we basically modeled that horn growth over time, which again, we're working to break apart these pieces to look at how males, to the best of our ability anyway, how males are growing horns over time and whether or not that pattern of growth is changing. And what you'll note in this instance, if we then predict out the size of seven-year-olds, so this is basically age-corrected horn size, what we're seeing is that males are, are becoming smaller over time after we've accounted for age, after we've done our best to account for other environmental considerations, at least to the best of our ability within this hunt area. Another example, uh, if we look at this, this hunt area, what we're seeing is changes in mean horn size over time. So it's declining size of males harvested over time, declining age of harvest over time. 
And so then when we look and see what that what that means with respect to how males are growing horns over time, that bottom right, their growth, at least with what we're seeing within this data set, is it's relatively stable over time. And so this is an example of a situation where there's a demographic effect of harvest. The reason why males are getting smaller in the harvest over time is largely driven by a shift in age structure over time. So be it as Marco acknowledged, um, these data sets are biased, but at least gives us a, a snapshot to be able to look far farther back in time than we can with, in most scenarios to this date, because we don't have the luxury of long-term data sets in most systems. <clears throat> And so we pulled and uh, data over 193 hunt areas across the West. And if we essentially summarize them and bring those to light by looking at, again, that change in pattern of horn growth over time after we count for age, after we do our best to account for environmental considerations, what we see is non-significant changes in horn, horn growth. So horn growth of seven, uh, horn size of seven-year-olds. So um, non-significant changes in 70% of the units, decreases in 22%, increases in 8%. Now, again, while acknowledging these considerations within these data, and then if we look at harvest practices across the range and what we, what we see within these hunt areas, what probably stands out to you to some degree, where at least we have a reasonable sample size with regards to hunt areas, is Alberta. And again, as Marco mentioned, Alberta has a fairly unique harvest model compared with most other of our Western states. And that is, is relatively unregulated from the perspective of access, uh, strict and, and driven strictly by a morphological criteria that is males attaining a specific size. So it's essentially the recipe for uh, leading to a potential, potential selective effect of harvest over time on growth of horns. These data are relatively consistent with that. And when we pull and look, look at hunting regulations across all these hunt areas, in about half of all the areas where we might expect to see change in patterns of horn growth driven by those harvest attributes, we see that consistency. The other thing that's noteworthy here is if we consider sheep hunting in general, and it being often a once in a lifetime experience, uh, and of course, most hunters are gonna wanna do their best to be able to go and harvest a large male, what that means, and, and put a lot of effort forth into it, what that means is most sheep hunting is selective. And what you'll note, and as Marco acknowledged, just because it, the harvest is selective doesn't imply that it's going to have deleterious consequences with respect to horn growth. It's a matter of being both selective and the level of intensity that's associated with it, which I think this data set uh, brings to light and is consistent with as well. I would like to now transition and highlight a few other pieces that I think are important for us to acknowledge when we're considering horn size and patterns of horn growth within bighorn sheep. And sorry for the somewhat gory picture and the sort of harsh transition. Uh, I think this is a really interesting example. And I think a lot of our conversations associated with management of bighorn sheep right now revolve around this question of respiratory disease, specifically pneumonia. Uh, and mycoplasma ova pneumonia. And while we're concerned what that means for dynamics of populations, uh, lamb survival and recruitment and their maintenance, the other, the other interesting aside and with some of the other work that we're, that we're currently doing is many adults will survive and persist through uh, these epizootic outbreaks or, or will end up with chronically infected populations that are simply carrying these pathogens. But what we're finding is that those pathogens potentially carry a nutritional burden, a burden to the extent of which, as member now, as I mentioned, horns don't necessarily come for free. Uh, they're not they're non essential for survival. And what that means that their growth is going to be also dictated by resources. And so what we saw when we were able to pull data across uh, across 12 hunt areas across a bunch of Western states where we both had pneumonia related data within those populations and good horn size and age data is what you'll note is in the blue here is this is total horn length with respect to age. In the blue are, is our populations with no exposure to those respiratory pathogens. In the orange is situations for males where they were exposed during their first two years of life in their horn length. And then in red is males sort of basically chronically uh, chronic presence of pneumonia within the population exposed during the first four years. So what's, and, and what you'll note, if we just put a rough marker on there where a three-quarter curl or full curl exist, 
what you notice even through even through this process of uh, the carriage of pathogens and presumably the nutritional burden that that takes is having a negative consequence for horn growth within bighorn sheep within these populations. One of my favorite examples to use when thinking about the potential role of resources in influencing horn growth comes from Cloyne National Park in the Yukon, where they did some work on bighorn sheep uh, decades ago. And what they did is they took some wild, uh, wild doll sheep, brought them into captivity, gave them high quality feed, and then raised them and monitored their horn growth over time, and then compared them to wild sheep on the mountain. So notably, this is the exact same genetic stock. It's basically a common garden experiment. What you see here on the left is the horn base circumference of those rams. On the right is horn length. Uh, the solid the solid circles are those those males that were brought into captivity. And so what you know relative to base circumference is the maximum basal circumference that was attained for wild rams was exceeded by four years of age in those captive rams. And if we go over to the right relative to horn length, basically those captive rams that had high nutrition, we're always consistently a year ahead in horn length than the wild rams. To the extent of which, if we look at the size that these rams attained, those rams that were on a better nutritional plane had 57% more horn volume than the animals in the wild that were not on as good of a nutritional plane. Very powerful evidence associated with the role of nutrition. In addition to that, we're able to take advantage of a fairly unique data set. So these are uh, bighorn sheep in the Sierra Nevadas of California, so endangered subspecies of sheep. And through the recovery and monitoring effort associated with this subspecies, they've been not only monitoring nutritional condition of females, so fat levels of females within these populations, but also been monitoring uh, size with respect to age of horns of males that they capture through their capture remarking and monitoring efforts. <clears throat> Notably, if we consider six of the different recovery units, what's really interesting is we see this gradient in both horn size and body mass across those herd units. <clears throat> so what we did is we simply we simply thought, well, could that be related to a difference in nutrition across those different herd units? And again, this is unhunted populations, endangered species. And what we did is we just simply looked at age corrected size of males within these populations. And we regressed that against how fat females were in autumn from those populations. Notably, again, we see this big gradient in horn size and in body mass. And we can explain over 86% 80, of the variation in size of males across those six recovery units, simply by how fat females are across those populations. Another clear demonstration of the dominant role of nutrition in influencing horn growth and size. So what does that mean for us with respect to these big males, the role of hunting, and the various factors that may influence horn growth? Well, I think with regards to our work from what Marco talked about, from what I just mentioned now, the other side that I think is, is, is commonly underappreciated as we focus on genetics, potential role of harvest, is that every one of those big rams got to start right here. And mom plays a humongous role in influencing and dictating what, what she's not only able to provision that, that lamb, that's, gonna, that's then gonna last him through the rest of his life and the nutrition is gonna play a role in a male's ability to grow horns each year thereafter. So when we think about that and we sort of pivot our thinking just a little bit with regards to these topics and we might think about habitat management, what does that mean for us on the ground? Of course, fire being one of our one of our primary tools associated with sheep management and our ability to, to, to make habitat advancements to benefit bighorn sheep populations. Now, of course, that can be somewhat of a crippling endeavor when we attempt to do that in designated wilderness or other places where it can be hard, uh, where, where sound ma management legislation that's designed to protect can often sometimes inhibit our ability to do good things from a conservation perspective as well. But the other side of that, that that brings to light is the notion of population density. Now, it doesn't imply that every sheep population is limited by density in some way, but I think we struggle with embracing the notion that more is not always better. And Marco mentioned this, and I think one of the best examples that illustrates this very notion is what occurred in Ram Mountain. And so what you'll look here is, 
over over time within Ram Mountain, what we see is a dramatic increase in the in within the population and the number of ewes that were present there. We see subtle increases in rams within in the population consistent with this massive increase within the population. It more than doubled. On the bottom here, what you see is the number of legal rams within the population. Now, as you remember, Marco indicated to us that basically harvest is unregulated, driven strictly by a morphological criteria. So all the rams that reach that size are eligible for harvest. What you'll note within this powerful data set is there were no more legal rams available during these two time periods when we had lower density to higher density and much more rams, and there were no more rams shot. The reason was is because at six to seven years of age during this period in blue before, 66% of the rams that reached six to seven years of age were legal. That declined to 34% uh, after the increase of the abundance of the population. Now that's notwithstanding, as Marco mentioned, the, the deleterious consequences of the harvest that was occurring during this period of time. But as you noted, that explained maybe three centimeters of the change over time which the change in horn size was a 15 centimeter change. And that change was largely driven by this increase in abundance. That increase in abundance occurred because during the time within the blue there, there was an active U harvest that was occurring during that period of time. So when we think about harvest and potential role within sheep populations, it is a great tool to be able to regulate density dependence and degree of nutritional limitation in populations where density dependence is occurring, even for sheep, which I think is sometimes hard for us to swallow. But here's a very great example, one of the most powerful examples, I would argue, where during that period of time in blue, there was a 12 to 20% harvest of ewes within that population that kept them at a moderate level that had, that had a cascading effect in how males grow horns because of that nutritional limitation uh, that was being regulated within the population during that period of time. So finally, I'll finish with acknowledging, I think uh, Marco wrapped it up really well with regards to the role of selective harvest. I think just because selective harvest is occurring doesn't imply that it's gonna have deleterious consequences. Can it? Yes. Uh, and it all depends upon the degree of intensity and selectivity of which it's occurring. And I think it's important simultaneously for, to, for us to acknowledge you know, much, much of this focus is also born out of our desire and our interest in big males and big horns. And the thing is, is who we should be, who we should not be forgetting in this conversation uh, is the role of mom and the role of her nutrition and the lasting nutritional effects that occur for males and their ability to grow horns within populations. With that, I'll finish. And I thank you very much for your time. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Kevin and Dr. Marco. That was very comprehensive. Wonderful. Uh, we will now open it up for question and answer. Yeah, go ahead, Vern. You'll need to unmute. Yeah, uh, Evan and Marco, I've known both of you guys uh, for a long time, and I think it was an outstanding uh, presentation on behalf of both of you. A uh, couple of questions, though, that come to mind. Uh, first, how would you respond to the argument that the removal of a large ram or a fast growing ram is problematic when his genes remain in the population and what you are doing is removing the genotype. His genes are still in that population. Uh, is that a legitimate argument? Uh, whomever wants to take that first, I appreciate. Um, okay, I can handle that and see what Kevin has to say. Hi, Marco. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Vern. Um, well, that's how selection works. Yes, the genes are still in the population because uh, the female and male relatives still carry those genes. The point is that if you remove the ram 
before he has a chance to breed. And again, it's not just if you remove that ram, but if you systematically remove most of the rams with rapidly growing horns before they have an opportunity to breed, that is how select, uh, evolution works because the breeding is going to be done by somebody else. Rams that have genetic characteristics that lead to smaller horns. And that's how you get evolution of smaller horns. Uh, that's just the basic way in which evolution works. If you remove the rams, the ram, when he's nine or 10, you probably have no impact because he's had the opportunity to breed and the gene is still in the population. And that's really what you know you should be doing. The key issue is killing promising rams with the genetic characteristics that lead to large horns before they have a chance to breed. Okay, and, and then the outcome of that is if you adjust harvest downward, um, there is a greater probability, obviously, of those desirable rams, for lack of a better term, uh, contributing to uh, their genetic material uh, forward. Yeah, that's why if your average age at which rams are getting shot, the example I show for the Norris territories is nine years and older, there's likely no problem. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of the age at harvest, but that combined with the selectivity of the harvest. You don't get shot as a four-year-old because you're your average four-year-old. You get shot right. as a four-year-old because your horns go rapidly, makes you legal under the Alberta definition when you're four, and so you get shot. Combined to a situation where there is an unlimited number of permits. I mean, I should point out hunting success in Alberta is about four percent. Any resident of Alberta can buy a tag, and you know, less than one in twenty will actually find kill a ram, mostly because there's hardly any legal rams left. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the legal rams get shot in the first two days of the season, or then in the last few days of the season when they start coming out of the national park. Very, very different from what happens in many US areas where, you know, if you start applying for a sheep permit when you're 16 and you continue to your 65, you got maybe a 4% chance of being drawn. It's <laughs> like a different planet. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think Marco and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, the notion, the notion of harvest being selective and that whole attribute associated with age. If you applied, you know, a crazy amount of selective pressure, but not until they were nine, as Marco said, it's going to create a completely different scenario than applying that same selective pressure when they're four or five. And then I think, and I think part of what you were getting at as well, Vern, is, you know, the lack, the lack of, the lack of selective pressure that's occurring, I mean, minimally on the female side of the equation. So you imagine a scenario, and I think I've, I've often referenced like commercial commercial fish harvest, where we can select both females and males that are potentially fast growing. You know, at least in this instance, you know, that that's that side of the equation is is not happening. Um, and so females are still Still, you know, and maybe that safeguards it a little bit, but females are still having that genetic contribution as well as that nutritional contribution on top of it. Thanks. I'd, I'd just love to sit down with both of you guys and, and have a beer sometime all at the same time. <laughs> we should do that. I think we should. Let's Thanks, meet guys. Alaska. I'm thinking in Reno. So I've got a question, Marco. You you talk about that four-year-old fast-growing ram, he's gonna have a higher probability of being shot in an over-the-counter uh, scenario like Alberta has. But to me, do you have any data that says that four-year-old didn't have more copulation or breeding opportunities because that you, she's not gonna know if he's four or seven if larger horns conveys some advantage for populations. And so I'm just curious if you have any data on that. A fast growing ram may get shot sooner, but he may also be engaged in more breeding than a, say, an average size four year old. Yeah, definitely, Kevin. You should know that I usually have data. Uh, horn size 
plays almost no role on male reproductive success till they're about seven. Because until they're about seven years of age, let's say six or seven, depending on you know the age structure, regardless of how big their horns are, an older ram is going to be dominant. So your large horn four-year-old is not going to have a higher reproductive success than a small horn four-year-old. Because what they need to do is cut off that you from the tending ram and try to copulate with her on the ram. So having large horns as a four-year-old doesn't help you having higher mating success, but it will get you shot because you're legal. And that is why this is a very specific issue with sheep and a definition of what you can, you cannot shoot based on horn size and how it plays into their mating system. So, and again, I try to, you know, this is really a key issue. Large horns have a positive effect if you're seven years of age and older. If you're younger than that, particularly if you're four or five, they have almost no effect because uh, your problem is not either four and five year old whose horns are smaller. Your problem is the eight year old that maybe has got small horn for an eight year old, but is bigger than you and is dominant. I have a question. Um, genetics is not my expertise, but has actually there been uh, genetic differences found in the rams of the same population? Some are that slower growing and some are that faster growing? Yes. Um, I mean, the genes linked with horn growth are no, is there isn't just a gene for rapid horn growth. It's a very complicated genetic architecture. So there is multiple genes that are located in different chromosomes. And Dave Coleman's still working on this. And it's not very easy to pin down because, um, again, it's not just one gene in one, lo in one chromosome. It's a multiple uh, set of genes. But yeah, uh, we can't. We are getting to the point that we can identify the actual genes that involve horn growth. Hmm. But again, I should point out that you know most of the variability you see in horn growth is, like Kevin pointed out, it's got nothing to do with genetics. It's nutrition, and uh, well, age obviously, and uh, uh, population density. But if you have the kind of intense selection that we have now in Alberta. And, you know, I mentioned 40% harvest of legal rams at Round Mountain. Fish and wildlife biologists in Alberta have started measuring, trying to do the sort of Yukon approach. The ram gets shot, it comes in for registration. They put it into this contraption, move it around and try to figure out how many years was this ram legal before he got shot. And the preliminary results suggest that maybe as many, in some area, maybe a 70 to 80% are shot the year to become legal. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredibly intensive selective pressure. It's really like domestic animals. It's like if you had a farmer that wants to produce, you know, dairy cattle and he kills her be his best milk producing cows. Still, what he feeds his cow, what the environment is like, is gonna have a much greater effect than genetics. But when you have that kind of intense selective pressure on a trade that is partly affected by genetics, uh, you get evolution. Thanks. Marco, Kevin again. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking of Joe Want and Brad Weinling and the Alaska Fishing Game guys and the data that they've looked at. And I think they're finding that, again, in an open, over the counter general season, not limited entry. The data I've seen or read, 50% of those rams are surviving two years beyond the age at which they were first legal. So that's, you know, that's contrary to the 70 or 80% chance of you know, getting killed. It's it's 50% or less in Alaska. I'm just trying to square those two differing percentages. Well, different in access. I mean, the situation you mentioned in Alaska, to me, that I would say that's great. You know, it, you know I, I wouldn't expect to see any problem. In Alberta, you know, we don't have fly-in 
hunting, much of the areas with their sheep, the access is reasonably good, especially we got people with horses and, uh, you know, one thing that we've seen within the province of Alberta, the harvest is shifted north. So the southern area where the access is easier, uh, there's way fewer legal rams than, say, 20 years ago. And in the north where the access is more difficult, uh, this decrease in size is not as strong. In fact, in the extreme northern areas where you don't, I mean, it's complicated by the fact that, you know, the northern areas, they get sheep coming out of a national park in October, November, and not as many of those get shot. But I mean, what you pointed out to Kevin is simply what we want. You know, if you got rams surviving on average two hunting season after they reach legal age, well, then that's fine. Uh, but it's not just, you know, it's not just the number of, of, of licenses, whether it's over the counter or not. It's over the counter in the Northwest Territories, and it's a three-quarter curl uh, legislation, but most of what they shoot is nine and 10 year old. There's maybe 15 to 20 that are shot in the NWT by residents and it's all fly in. So it doesn't matter whether it's over the counter, uh, you know, not so many people can afford a plane and go hunt sheep in the Norris territories. In a borough, there's basically when you can leave in the morning, shoot your ram and come back in the evening. So if, if I may ask a follow-up in Alberta, and maybe Beth can speak to this as well, um, has the Alberta government addressed yes. access management? Questions. You know, and Darren, I see Darren's on the on the call as well. But what I'm getting at is, it seems like more and more places with ATVs and side by sides, and more and more access, motorized access, making it, it almost easier for that day hunter, that weekend hunter. Has Alberta, to your knowledge, addressed? access management or travel management relative to sheep hunting. Kevin, we are talking about Alberta. We like to use up oil and gas. <laughs> uh, getting access with ATV is a God-given right. Okay, I exaggerate, <laughs> but the answer is no. So a few years ago, the Alberta Fish and Wildlife Biologists unanimously recommended a change to full curl. And partly because of things that went on, you may, you've all read the Journal of Wildlife Management special issue that was essentially an attack on my research, which led to a committee on publication editing, investigating the journal and putting it under a six month uh, probation, which you probably never heard of because the editors never said anything to anyone. Uh, so the Fish and Wild Biologists suggested, you know, let's move to full curl. And that was kiboshed by, uh, by the government. Uh, but um, no, I mean, uh, you know, I'm very happy to speak to Central Wild Sheep Foundation because, you know, they believe in science and they listen to data. It's not the attitude I'm getting from your Alberta group where I'm still being presented sort of as the devil. Um, but no, I mean, uh, you know, it's not that hard to, it's not rocket science. There is no problem with evolution in much of the states because harvest is limited. People, you know, there's a lot of large rams that survive to be eight, nine, 10 years old and breed. You don't have in most of the states a two months or two months and something long season with unlimited number of permits, no restrictions on, uh, you know, just uh, a legal definition of, uh, of what you can shoot. And even in places where there's no vehicle access, these are such valuable animals that people really want to kill that you know they get in with horses so like i said you know the success rate is about four percent it gives you an idea of the amount of effort that's going into this and just by comparison last comment i'll make uh that world record ram off wild horse island in flathead lake in 2016 broke the old the alberta record by seven inches or so that was an eight and a half year old ram so looking at monty's work obviously he grew big he grew big in a hurry. Yeah. So how old was that roadkill ram that was the Alberta record? Do you remember? Uh, no, I think it was 10 by the time it was roadkill. I think it was shot when he was eight and he survived. I mean, you know, it's, an, it's anecdotal, but after he got shot in the head, it looked like he took, pulled himself off all the competition for breeding. He just spent the rest of his life feeding. And maybe that contributed to the growth of the horns, but I, I think it was about 10, um, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
Thanks. Okay, anyone else? We did have a question in the chat. Uh, Kevin and Marco, did you see that? Kevin? Yeah, and it's something else that is very useful to bring up because, you know, Kevin mentioned how this research has been used by anti hunting to say, oh, you know, the moment you have any kind of trophy hunting, uh, it's going to be an apocalypse, a disaster, and, uh, you know, the end of the world. And why tell deer the little that we have information on mare apparatus success suggests that the size of the antlers doesn't actually play a huge role? It's a bit fragmentary, but it's quite interesting. That really makes me wonder, well, you know, when, why do they have antlers? But, you know, we shape, once they get past double seven years, there's a clear effect of horn size on mating success. Why tell deer it doesn't seem to be the case? And uh, uh, yeah, you know, the question is correct. Half the genes are carried by the doe and, uh, or the female. And so in shape, the selection is only towards males, which means that the strength, the selective effect is half as big as if both males and females were harvested based on the size of the horns. Um, so I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, so Kevin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, agreed. And I think it's kind of as you laid out and uh, I guess towards the end of your talk for at least bighorn sheep, given their mating system, the role of horns within the mating system, the degree of heritability, which even like compared with white-tailed deer, when we look at heritability in antler size within white-tailed deer, it's different than it is for sheep. And so it's kind of the, just the right recipe. And so even when, it, so making blanket Blanket statements like select, selective hunting is bad and yields deleterious consequences for horn growth, antler growth, whatever the case may be, um, is a bold overstatement um, in, in many different ways. And even as we just talked about today relative to bighorn sheep, um, can it? Yes. Does it always? No. It all, it, it's the sort of all depends, all depends scenario given the degree of intensity with which it occurs. So. And as I often say, with regards to the role of the doe or the female, I guess, uh, I think it's it's an interesting play because you have the genetic contribution of the male, you have the genetic contribution of the female, but then you also have the nutritional contribution of the female. So the bigger role in what dictates the size of the male by far comes from the female as opposed to as opposed to the male. But Wonderful. Anything else? Vern, you got your hand up? You're on mute. Got it. Thank you. Um, Kevin, which brings me to a question that I, I wanted to ask. Um, I think you said the R squared between uh, um, body condition and, and of of the mother and and horn size or maybe it was at a population level i'm not i'm not really sure um but i know that they're able to handle every single male and obviously they did because you have horn measurements you know on those that you included in the regression um what was the body condition of those male sheep just out of curiosity what was what was the r squared uh there so that's a good question. It was not, it was not near as strong as it was for the females. I think just given some of the variability and then timing, timing of when those males are handled is consistently post rut. And so I think given, given those, and at least, um, especially what we see in, um, in other ungulates as well, males, interestingly, burn most of what they have through the rut and kind of bottom out at sort of an even even playing field. I think if we could have handled them pre-rut, we would have seen some of those signatures in a more obvious way than we do than we would have post-rut. So the relationship was stronger. I don't remember what the R squared was, but the relationship was stronger with females, again, because 
I think it was more of a representative sig signal of range condition as opposed to the males, which was more washed out because of the rut related signature. And and this was females prior to birth the following year. Or so all, all, the, all the yeah. sheep captured in the, you know, basically the first of April. Yeah. So we had both. And what it is, is it's just population level means because the reality is captures don't happen every year and there's fluctuations in conditions year to year. So we just average it across. So it is just population level, very simple. So just a single metric, basically average of conditions that we see. And we looked at it both in autumn for lactating females and then also in spring. The relationship holds strongly on either side. I think the R squared is like 0.8 in the spring, and it was 0.86 in the in for in the autumn for lactating females. So both those signals were very strong, whether we looked at fat of females in the spring or fat of females in autumn. I, I didn't realize that there were so many sheep caught in the fall. I, I thought it was virtually almost all springtime. But... There was enough for us to be able to look at it. So <laughs> yep, yep, you had a sample. Yep. Yeah, and and we weighted it by the you know by the variance associated with it and stuff like that. But yeah, it was the the relationships were surprisingly strong. Maybe not surprisingly, I don't know. It's it's rare that you get R squares that big. And granted, it's small sample size, but population level. So yeah, powerful relationship. Thanks to both you guys for enlightening us. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, and I'd like to point out that anybody that was expecting to see a fist fight, you'd be sorely disappointed. <laughs> Kevin and I actually agree on nearly everything, so sorry about that. I think just, just uh, I think we all uh, agree on one thing, and and that's the importance of habitat, you know, in the big picture. And uh, I know Marco, you and uh, uh, Mark Boyce have had different opinions on, on different things, but I recall an article perhaps in science, I'm, I'm not certain of that, but where you both emphasized habitat is where we need to be concerned. And I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm sure everybody on this, this call can uh, kind of agree with that, but thanks again. Yeah, and it's a bit too bad that, you know, this gets all the attention, all the controversy, but as we all know, <laughs> you know, it's habitat and disease. This, trophy hunting thing and evolution effects, a bit of a sideshow in sheep conservation. I mean, there's an interesting question on, you know, uh, somebody in the in the chat said, is how big is the movement to criticize trophy hunting? And it's something that I think we're all aware, you know, the word trophy, people react negatively. I mean, there's a campaign in BC, you know, after they managed to shut down the grizzly hunt, now they're going after black bears. And one of their main technique is to call it a trophy hunt. Which is ridiculous. People shoot black bears to eat them, uh, but we, you know, and uh, in a way, the worst thing that's happening is people posting pictures of dead animals, and it's just a wonderful thing for anti-hunting groups because it, you know, it looks gross. So, Burn, having spent this morning on the on a deal with Eric Rominger. It's all about top-down predation. Doesn't have anything to do with bottom-up nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but without the habitat, the cats wouldn't have anything to eat. So yeah, yeah. yeah but what you said, Kevin, plays into you know, and I totally agree with Kevin Monteith on the fact that yeah, when things are going well, you seasons are great, but if you're Sheep population is being kept down by a specialist cougar. The last thing you want to do is shoot ewes. And the same is if your population is mostly being affected by pneumonia, the last thing you want to do is shoot ewes. So it, it's it's a complicated uh, issue. At the same time, you know, you shouldn't be paying people to kill cougars in sheep habitat because most cougars don't touch the sheep. They just happen to be there and hunt deer. And if you kill a deer killing cougar, maybe the replacement will kill sheep. So all right. Well, I think we're sorry, go ahead. No, nope, thanks, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you everyone uh for coming here today. I think that those last few comments really wrap up 
uh, what we were looking to accomplish and that, you know, uh, we've got a lot of things that we agree on, um, but there's definitely some controversy out there and it's a complicated issue, but habitat and uh, hunting, you know, different ways of hunting are, are really important uh, topics and appreciate you all. We're going to post this uh, video. So if you know anyone who missed it that would like to see it, or if you would like to watch it again, uh, we will have it posted very shortly. Thank you again. Uh, appreciate all your efforts and everything that you do. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.